Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God, our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Please be seated. It's time to get ready for Christmas. A big thank you to all those who faithfully and beautifully prepared grace for with Christmas and Advent decorations. Um, our, our whole world, our, our neighborhood, Chevy, and everyone else is getting ready for Christmas. And, and I don't mean that we, and we love to get ready for Christmas. I don't mean simply that we love the day of Christmas. We are getting ready for Christmas months ahead of time. Some people and radio stations start playing their holiday music as soon as Halloween is over. We have Christmas food, Christmas music, and Christmas traditions, and tons of shopping. So whether you've gone all out or thrown out your Christmas decorations, you can't help but be surrounded by all the Christmas, pre-Christmas activities and customs. Uh, so much is happening long before uh, Christmas even arrives. Now, there's nothing, there's nothing particularly Christian or unchristian uh, about most of these activities, uh, but they certainly can be fun and help create wonderful memories, or if nothing else, at least sizable Christmas bills and Christmas bellies. But Advent today is not about getting ready for Christmas, which is probably what most of us have think of Advent as. But today is about getting ready for the kingdom of heaven. John went out into the wilderness, we read, to preach that God's kingdom was coming. It was arriving, in fact, as he spoke. And this is an exciting news and welcome change uh, for the Jews. It was a long-awaited pivot away from life as they had known it. You see, many Jews did not want to be Roman citizens. They wanted to see God's kingdom restored with a good and faithful ruler, not someone like Herod or Caesar or Philip. That's why John attracts the crowds as he does. He's preparing for the way, the way, not for a pagan kingdom, but for the kingdom of the Lord. As we get into the Advent season, we are faced with reminders from John the Baptist to pivot away from life as we know it as well. You see, Advent is more about getting ready for God's kingdom than getting ready for Jesus' birth. We celebrate Jesus' birth, of course, and we give thanks, but, but that's ancient history, important and holy history, but still history. But we remember at Advent particularly that God's kingdom is not ancient history. It's a living reality. It's the kingdom we have been invited to live within. Advent is a reminder that Jesus came not just in the past, but he comes to us today. The incarnation of our Lord was not just God coming to Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. It's a reminder that God's kingdom and salvation is among and coming among us. However, it's important in John's uh, Luke chapter 3 fits into this. It, it, it's important to remember that simply identifying with Judeo-Christian values doesn't make you a member of God's kingdom. Just because you come to church doesn't necessarily mean you're a citizen of God's kingdom. How do you live as a member of God's kingdom? Well, you might get ready for Christmas by listening to, I don't know, you know, Fred, uh, I don't know, I, Mariah Carey or is it Fred Astaire? I, I should have double-checked this. He sings a bunch of Christmas songs, somebody, uh, or Michael Buble, what's it? Frank Sinatra, that, yeah, that's who I was trying to think of. So we know who you listen to. No. <laughs> no, yeah, so you might get ready for Christmas by listening to those folks, or maybe you get ready for Christmas by following the instructions of, say, Betty Crocker or Martha Stewart or some, somebody. But if you want to get ready for Jesus' coming kingdom, you could start by listening to, well, John the Baptist. Or, instead of following Betty Crocker's instructions, following our Savior's instructions. 
You see, you don't get ready for Christmas or, I mean, you don't get ready for God's coming kingdom by putting up your best Christmas display, the best Christmas display in the neighborhood. It doesn't matter whether or not you had a successful Black Friday or Cyber Monday deal. Not even your best Christmas cookies will necessarily help you prepare for the coming kingdom of God. John tells us what will, though. And the first thing is that the people do in Luke chapter 3 is that they come out of the cities. Um, they have to leave something behind, and John's instructions are really only going to reinforce that. To be part of God's kingdom, the first thing we do is leave something behind. We might have to leave behind some comforts or possessions or perhaps even people. We certainly are called to leave our pursuit of sinful pleasures behind us. As soon as the crowds arrive, John tells the crowds the next thing, which is to repent and to live as if they meant it. Then he talks about how God is going to make a highway through the wilderness. This is reminiscent of what God did for the Israelites in Exodus, right? He made a highway through the wilderness. He led them through the wilderness to the promised land. In the wilderness, Yahweh gave the Israelites food when they were hungry. When they needed water, he sated their thirst. When they met enemies, he overcame them. Even when they faced rebellion and division from within, Yahweh backed his leaders so that those who you know, wanted to follow Yahweh, who wanted to know what they should do, they would clearly know by God's um, identification and uh, aligning with these leaders, they would know who to listen to and follow. Well, John wants to make something very clear. Faithfully following God is still required for God's people. And so he warns the crowds, don't say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. You know, see, lineage, descent, ethnicity, that's not the key. Being a Lutheran, even, doesn't mean that you are a member of God's kingdom. In order to take part of God's kingdom, you absolutely must repent. Instead of living according to the rules and pleasures of this world and the human flesh, we live according to God's rules, seeking to do His will. And what is it that God wants? What exactly should we do? There's lots of advice, but today we'll focus on some of the practical advice, uh, John, practical Christian advice that John gives us. One, Christians should share stuff. John tells everyone, he tells the whole crowds, anyone with two tunics should share with the one who has none, and anyone who has food should do the same. Pretty straightforward concept. Share. Following Jesus is not about heritage or rights. It's really about Christ. It starts with a God who made us all and has given us all and has sent his son to give up all for us. Christmas is, is, and it's a great tradition, Christmas is a great time to share. But for Christians, there's really no bad time to share things like clothes and food. Sharing is not only a holiday tradition, it's a Christian commitment. Now, I don't know, I'm, I'm sort of guessing that perhaps the tax collectors felt guilty, but maybe not, but they asked for some further clarification, so John gives them some business advice. John tells the tax collectors, don't collect more than you are required to. Now, from what we know about the tax collectors, they might not have loved this advice because they loved their profit. They extorted and gouged people regularly if the other historical sources are to be trusted. So what does that mean for us? Well, I think at the very least, it means it's not all about the profit margin. We should not be looking to fleece people. We should take no more from one another than is required, uh, to use John's verbiage. We, we need to live, and certainly life gets expensive, so you know, it's not that there's no profit, but we should be thinking about what we need, not how much we can take people for or get away with. Um, the soldiers uh, follow up with John, and John tells them as well, don't abuse your power to take advantage of people. And don't make false accusations 
and be content with your pay. If you have more power than someone else, it's nat the natural thing to do is to use that power to your advantage. Everyone's got to fend for themselves, right? People with power, you know, we see this regularly, people with power want to make sure that they take complete advantage of it because they don't know when they will lose their power. But Jesus, he will reign for all eternity. So we don't have to resort to plotting and scheming. We know that Jesus will take care of us forever. So we don't have to throw people under the bus to get ours now, now because God's going to take care of us forever. He also says, uh, don't accuse people falsely. Uh, sometimes being loud or having the biggest platform seems to be the most, to be more important than being fair or honest. Sometimes, however, the, the best way to pursue truth is often to say less <laughs> and to av avoid idle, or we might say idle, speculation. It often makes sense to stick to what you know to be good and true, or if we wanted to get even more narrow, we might say stick to the, the, the good one above all. Well, uh, upon hearing all this helpful, uh, challenging, um, and, and Yahweh-like advice, the crowds wonder, is John the Christ? He, he sure sounds like the kinds of things Yahweh says. But John is clear. I'm not that guy. These instructions are necessary, he says, to prepare for God's kingdom. That's why John is called. We still must do some of these things, or all of them. You, I, we must still leave something behind. We must leave the world behind, you might say. We still must repent, live honestly and generously, and repent again when we realize how far we've fallen short. We are called to repent, to share, um, and to be honest and fair, but we also must remember these things will not bring about salvation. There's only one who brings about salvation, and that's who we focus on, not only in Advent, but throughout our Christian life, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's he who has baptized you. A, a, a baptism into, de in, into death, a baptism into his death, and a promise of resurrection. Through Jesus, he's already defeated our enemies, forgiven our sins, and through his resurrection, he has brought about a new kingdom. He comes and he has baptized us, as John says, with his Holy Spirit and with fire. And he is our king and our savior. And we, by grace and baptism, are Jesus' people and citizens of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen.